You are listening to Beyond the Verse, a Star Citizen podcast. A show dedicated to Cloud Imperium games, Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Whether you fight, explore, unite, and or trade, we bring you news, updates, interviews, reviews, and analysis. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a pour of Radagast, and join us as we go Beyond the Verse. Launch sequence activated. Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 32 of Beyond the Verse Star Citizen podcast. I am your host, Solus. Welcome in. We are calling today's episode IAE uh, because of IAE 2953 coming in the next week. So November 17th, I set off on this podcast with the sole purpose of wanting to address the lore, the limited whole ships, what you can expect. Um, And I've teased a little bit of that throughout social media, and it's been catching quite the firestorm. I I posted something about the limited whole ships, um, and it has over 5,000 views and a lot of engagement and conversation. So we're going to be getting into that as our main purpose of today's episode. But we will also get into... The RSI Zeus Mark II Q&A, we're going to quickly go over the looking for questions segments that they're asking for our participation as a community for Friday's Star Citizen Live. We will then go into the November subscriber promotions, a quick look at the Squadron 42 monthly report, and then we will get into the Inside Star Citizen, um, CitizenCon 2953 behind the scenes video that dropped yesterday. Uh, And again, we will end things by talking about the lore of IAE, the Whitley's Guide, Jax, everybody's favorite NPC. It's going to be a fun-filled show. But before we do, many, many, many times in my podcast, I have brought up my brother, and today is his birthday. So happy birthday, D-Rock, for those of you in our Discord community, Soul Provision. So happy birthday, my dude. Okay, to the community. Here we go. Incoming message. All right, at the end of every single podcast, we go on to Spotify and we ask uh, a Q&A and polls. So last week when we did episode 31, Burn, Star Citizen 321, um, we asked the question, how has your time in the Pyro Preview Channel been so far? We had two responses. Donovan Salter Green says, had a really good time so far. Played with my org as well as solo. Looking forward to being in game which should be next year, 2024. So actually today is also the last day for those of you that are in the preview channel. So this is it, like go in and do your thing, um, experience as much of it as you can before it goes out, uh, the preview channel. But, you know, Donovan touches on a little bit of something I addressed last week. you got to go in with an org. You got to go in with uh, a team, right? Because there's a little bit of like controversy on um, the PvP aspect, and there's no, you know, armistice. Okay, go in with a two, you know, two or three good friends. You'll be fine. You'll be fine doing whatever you want to do. Um, but yes, go in with an org. It's a lot more fun. This game in general is significantly more fun uh, when you are with friends. The second response was from It's Just Metal, a name that you're uh, becoming very familiar with if you listen and watch the show. They say, honestly, not too bad, a bit buggy, but nowhere near as bad as others experience. Yeah, kind of short and to the point, but yes, a lot of individuals have uh, expressed that it's it's unplayable, quote unquote. I disagree. I thought I was able to get some pretty good sessions out of it. But um, there has been pretty... Um, Uh, dramatic issues with some of the experiences so you know it's the typical star citizen things like kind of glitching through as you're walking uh the desync i think is probably the more technical term for it um areas not showing up on the map you know you uh, arrive there but the location's actually physically not there. Uh, so those typical things, but it's also the preview channel. It's also pre 
PTU. So this is somewhat of an expectation. Um, but I'm glad your experience is just metal. I'm glad your experience is not as atrocious as those uh, that are the most loud on social media. We also asked the poll, and this is going to get a little bit into the PTU 321 update. Um, but we asked the question, which testing focus for PTU 321.1 most interests you? And the five options was ship trespass, data heist, new player experience, vehicle light refactor, and the Crusader C1 Spirit. Uh, it had a pretty good uh, turnout for votes. There was a tie in first place for ship trespass and the new player experience. That was actually a surprise to me. Usually, if you're listening to this podcast, um, you're not really you're not really a new player. And even if you were, you wouldn't really know that this is what you're most interested in testing. It's kind of I don't know. I didn't think this was going to be um, one of the top selections. Ship trespass makes sense. Ship trespass is going to be super important in pyro when there's no armistice and it's going to be piracy heavy and it's going to be all the things that you know you're going to want to inspect your ship before you take off, especially in pyro. So that's interesting. And then in second place was data heist and then a tie between vehicle light refactor and the Crusader uh, C1 Spirit. So I thought that was really awesome. Um, again, at the end of every single episode over on Spotify podcasts, uh, there will be a question, uh, a question and answer in a poll for you to participate in. And don't forget, you can also email us at contact at beyond the first And we will go through the emails like we did last episode and talk about any comments, concerns, questions, uh, anything event. If you want a, a place to vent, you know, this would be a good place to do that. So alrighty. I think that's uh, I think that's really it. Um, last week we kind of went heavy into uh, a segment about whiskey and bourbon, so I kind of wanted to do somewhat mm, somewhat similar, but kind of an educational moment um, for those of you who might be interested. But there is what's called the ABCs of bourbon, and I did have this pulled up, and shame on me for not still having it pulled up. So. In our Discord, in Soul Provision, I have Bar Citizen as a channel, and it's all things like bourbon, whiskey. It's it's just a place to hang out, kind of a speakeasy culture um, for those of us in the community to hang out and talk our favorite spirits, right? So here I have like a list of all the things um, bourbon-wise, and I thought it'd be interesting to share quickly the ABCs. So this is super interesting. Um, I am pretty damn sure that bourbon is the most federally regulated liquor or spirits i'm gonna say in the world um but you have to abide by these certain criteria in order to be considered a bourbon all right here we go abc's a bourbon a has to be american made so in order to be called a bourbon it's got to be an american made so if you see a um a scotch Right, or if you see um, anything else outside, like a, a Japanese has has a lot of whiskeys, um, it's not bourbon. Bourbon has to be made in America. It doesn't have to be the Kentucky lime water, but I mean it. it it should be to be a legitimate bourbon, in my opinion. But um, it just has to be American made. B stands for barreled in new oak. Now it has to be initially barreled in new oak. There are some bourbons that will go through a second uh, aging phase out of like a wine barrel, uh, but all the wood is essentially new oak, and that's pretty typical for most Rick houses. Um, we'll get into the seasonality at some point for those of you that care, but it's the flexing, uh, the ebb and flow of the actual wood itself that gives bourbon its flavor, its taste. C. Corn. It's got to be over 51% corn based. So in the mash bill or the weight distribution of ingredients, the majority has to be corn, right? So 51% more corn. Um, usually the mash bill consists of corn, rye, wheat, malted barley, and water. Water, of course, so you have some sort of viscosity, right? Um, but corn has to be 51% or more. If it's a rye, then obviously it's majority rye. So like the Angel's Envy rye that we spoke about last week, it's like 90, 95% rye, very spicy. 
but the more corn you have, the more sweet. That's why a bourbon is sweeter than a rye. It's more easier to drink, right? That's why you get the misinterpretation that a bourbon is more watered down. It's because it's, it's corn, so it's a sweeter flavor, right? Keep going. D, distilled. Distilled at no more than 160 proof. So distilled is the first process. It's a chemical reaction that separates um, basically the the ingredients into like its alcohol form. There's a lot of science behind it. I don't want to sound like a, a nerd on this <laughs> on this podcast, but de, uh, it has to be distilled at 160 proof, entered at no more than 125 proof. Really, so divide that in half. A proof is double the alcohol content. So when I say 160 proof, it's 80% alcohol. So distilled at 160 proof, entered in barrel, no more than 125 proof, and then when it's filled into the bottle for distribution, it's no less than 80 proof. So there's your DEF, distilled, entered, filled, and last, genuine. Genuine meaning the color of what you have. So if you're on, uh, if you're on YouTube, um, the color of this Angel's Envy, right? This is the actual color of the ingredients or the mash bill that has ebb and flowed through the wood of the barrel. It has no additives. It's not like it's going to get any food coloring to make it a certain color, right? Back in the day when there was like prohibition and all that nonsense, they would put, uh, I mean, horrible ingredients like oil and just horrible stuff to make it look a certain way. But then they would also add like food coloring to again, again, get that copper or um, uh, kind of an almond color to the drink. And so they, you know, federally, federally regulated, you cannot do that. So that's it. That's it for this week <laughs> in uh, our speakeasy session uh, for the for the Beyond the Verse community. So awesome. Let's get into this week in Star Citizen. Sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce that Xi'an word, but hi, everyone. We've been thrilled to welcome you all to Pyro on the preview channel for the first time and the teams are incredibly grateful for the staggering amount of positive feedback. We've kept a watchful eye on your experiences so far, both through our backend data and your collective comments, and we couldn't be more excited about the future of the verse. While there's only a few playtests left for now, you can find our updated schedule here. If you're looking for even more Pyro goodness, we recently released a Galactopedia update with details about the system. Learn more about the company that discovered it and meet some of the people who live there. Break. This is all of last week's episode. So go to episode 31, watch Burn. It's, it's all about the Galactopedia update. Back to the article. While our eyes are still full of stars, you can replay many of the presentations shared during CitizenCon 2953 on YouTube. We have prepared chapters and timestamps for you to easily navigate and scope out of the content that interests you most. If you joined us in Los Angeles, you might have had your picture taken on our Drake Dragonfly. Enjoy the photos from Saturday and Sunday. Beyond, why does this, this reads, now this is this week. <laughs> it reads like it was two weeks ago. Uh, beyond the show, many development teams diverted their attention to the upcoming patch releases planned to close out the year. Have a look at our Star Citizen Monthly Report for all the latest updates on ships, locations, missions, and more coming soon and into 2024. Our Roadmap Roundup also offered an early look at what's coming in Star Citizen Alpha 322. And it gets into now, let's see what's going on this week, which we covered at the beginning or the top of this episode. So yeah, that read as if it was like two weeks ago, but essentially just a lot of movement uh, from or transition from CitizenCon into the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo of 2953. So there's a lot to cover, which that's, that's why we're here. Um, and then quickly, I, uh, we, we alluded to patch 321.1 in the PTU. Um, I do want to address that real quick. There were several, several updates this past week, um, but only for like the audience. So now as of yesterday, we are up to wave four testers. It's still the same testing focuses, just quickly reading through it. Um, ship trespass, data heist, or data heist, um, new player experience, a new Babbage, vehicle headlight refactor, uh, tractor beam, T2, 
vehicle tractor beam crusader c1 spirit the argo srv first person shooter ai behavior integration and siege of oris and global event reactivation so no real changes to the testing focus just that it's now available to wave four testers okay we are going to save IAE 2953 updates that came out on Monday or Tuesday, uh, very early in the week, but we're going to save that to the end of the, the uh, episode. I keep wanting to say call because like I'm in that work mindset. <laughs> so let's get into quickly. Um, I'm reordering what I want to talk about. So there's kind of it's kind of choppy right now. Let's let's move this here. All right, let's go ahead and share screen. So on um, Tuesday or Wednesday, earlier in the week, CIG came out asking for questions for Star Citizen Live for both navigating the universe and the fix it, fly it. At the time of listening to this podcast, it's too late. It's Friday morning as I record. Um, it's for today's Star Citizen Live. You might be able to get in your question last minute, uh, but these questions are gonna go in front of the panel to discuss each one of these topics. So for navigating the universe, I think there's a lot of uh, topics, just going through like the timestamps of the video. There's navigating the universe with David Bone Gill, technical director, uh, evolving user interface, cartography, the star map, right? So the huge, huge topics uh, that we are going to be experiencing in the next couple of patches for Star Citizen. And then for Fix It and Fly It, we have the engineering gameplay loop, right? Activities as a crew member, maintenance and malfunctions, right? And then you have the actual demonstration uh, towards the end of that. So this is neat. I, I like what they're doing here. First off, engaging with the community, sincerely interested in what we have to say and questions and feedback, et cetera. Um, it's, uh, it's a good sign, right? But it's also your way to, to get engaged with um, maybe post-Citizen Con analysis. And I say this because going into next week, it's highly likely that most of the topics in Citizen Con will have this. So be on the lookout in Spectrum for maybe the next couple of Star Citizen live inquiries. Maybe you have a question about base building and next week might be about base building. Well, here's your opportunity to jump into Spectrum, put your question in that field uh, and hopefully become part of that conversation, right? So it's just, again, a fun way that CIG is engaging with those of us in the community. So awesome, badass, keep it up CIG, loving it. To the Zeus Mark II Q&A, this is a long time coming, and I don't necessarily know why it took so long to get the Q&A out. Usually, when a new ship or new hull uh, is released, immediately after is like the Q&A, like the next day. Uh, this took a long time, and what I think, what I think uh, happened um, is that obviously they wanted to get out in CitizenCon, they wanted to like you know showcase and get sales on it, uh, but they were probably still hashing out the details. I would imagine uh, this this was fresh off the press at CitizenCon, and so it took them you know a week two weeks to get this out. I'm not going to go line by line, um, but I will go through every single question, just so you know that you can you can go here uh, after this podcast or after you're watching on YouTube, and you can see you know these questions. So the RSI Zeus Mark II, the first question: It's a smaller ship than the Spirit, but its cargo variant holds more than twice the cargo of the C1, more than the Mercury. Why would someone choose a C1 Spirit over the Zeus Mark II? Okay, I probably will go line by line. I think this is a good dialogue. Um, if you're into like the ship discussion and why there's like a million different versions of you know cargo carriers, well, this, these are considerations, especially going into IAE where every ship is gonna be on sale. It might be good to consider all of these attributes in a ship. So let's go through the answer. Firstly, the Zeus ZL cargo variant has three times, or three times S2 shields, or three size two shields. The four size two shields are reserved for the ES or the exploration model. We'll be discussing this more in the near future, but due to the upcoming changes to components to support the resource network, 
as demonstrated in the fix it or fly it panel at CitizenCon, we'll be doing a big rebalance of item uh, numbers in numerous existing ships. So expect other ships to see their numbers changed. Break. This is why I don't understand content creators who make their MO or their brand ship analysis. It renders, at this point in Star Citizen, it renders their content irrelevant. So the moment you see a review on some ship, a year later, at the very least, a year later, it's obsolete. It's, it's not accurate information, so that, that content dies in the background. Now, it's, it's great dialogue. I'm not judging. I'm not saying these content creators shouldn't do it, but this is why I don't put a lot of eggs in that basket. I don't, because it's going to change the weight distribution, the um, the meta builds. And as I talk in the back of my mind, I'm actually thinking it's not really different than like rotations in Elder Scrolls Online or, you know, these best in slot builds in World of Warcraft. It's not a lot different than that because that content does change as well. So you might have just witnessed me changing my mind real time. <laughs> uh, and I think that's fair. I think we should do that more often and be a little bit transparent with our thoughts. I, I take it, I take it all back. I take it all back. Cause it, it is no different than what most content creators do for any other game. All right. That's fair. Back to the article. Secondly, the spirit is much more agile and has a higher top speed than the Zeus Mark II, favoring maneuverability and not getting hit over raw SCU carrying capacity. During production, however, we've managed to get the C1 spirit to hold 64 SCU versus the proposed 48 SCU. My reaction to that, and then we will need to move quickly because I don't want to spend the whole time on the Q&A. It's really no different than talking about like the whole E versus the whole A. Why would you purchase a whole A if the whole E can hold so much more? Well, you give up like the solo play loop. You give up so much to be able to carry or transport so much more material. Well, there's a caveat or there's like the uh, antithesis of doing that or the penalty of doing that. Um, so you need these different versions. So there is a, a use case for someone to get this C1 spirit over the Zeus Mark II. All things that you need to consider as a gamer going into IAE, are you gonna play mostly solo? Are you gonna play mostly with a group of three or an entire org? That should determine where you put your actual real life money. And we'll get into that whole concept in about two, after the Squadron 42 monthly report, we'll get into it for the IAE. All right, what is the range of the QED? Uh, and is it a snare or a dampener? So <clears throat> it's just a quantum dampener, not a quantum enforcement device, which combines a snare and a dampener. A snare holds you in place, a dampener slows you down. The range will be a similar to, uh, the range will be similar to the one found in the Drake Cutlass Blue. Awesome. Are the EMP and quantum dampener pilot control? This was interesting, not to read this verbatim, uh, but they're trying to make it where every seat can control all of the capability um, of the Zeus MR. Is the Zeus Mark II CL, or the Zeus CL, able to travel through small jump points, making it the current largest cargo ship to do so? Likely yes. Why do prisoner boxes need extra space? Is it possible to place them on a normal cargo grid? Um, Prisoner pods can be stored in cargo grids, but take up relatively large volume and items cannot be stacked on top of them. I actually like this, guys. I, I like that it's not just a plug and play. It's not just like, here's a box, regardless of its intent or purpose. Um, I like how they're making it, uh, they're attributing it to its purpose. So no, you're not gonna put anything on top of a, uh, of a, uh, a prisoner pod. Cool, makes sense. All right. Are there any escape pods? Yes. The room opposite the armory and the MR looks empty. What is its functions for armor, suit lockers? What is the Zeus's top speed? Um, it's ever changing, but it'll be lower than the Spirit C1. There you go. As the Explorer variant will have more shields, will the Bounty Hunter variants have significantly heavier armor to compensate? The goal is yes, basically shield power for armor. There's like a balance. Is it gonna have more shield power or is it just simply gonna have more armor? 
Does the Zeus fuel ha uh, does the Zeus have fuel recovery? Yes, it's a top remote turret pilot controlled. Uh, currently, the gunner seat will control the bottom turret on all versions, and the co-pilot will control the top turret on the MR and the tractor beam on the CL. What are the intended roles for each of the three crew members? This is interesting. Uh, I think small squad and org play is where Star Citizen is going to shine. So I love these questions when it comes to what's the purpose or role of each player. Regarding the bridge seats, one is a dedicated pilot seat, obviously, and the others are co-pilot and gunner specifically. In terms of roles, we don't want to lock players to set roles within ships, duh. So whilst, 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 I've never like seen that in actual like, <laughs> Uh, an actual paper. So whilst, whilst, so while naturally one player would be flying the ship, the other two are free to assist in navigation, defense via turrets, offense via missile operator mode, um, EMP quantum dampening, or deal with engineering issues that arise. Can the Zeus Mark II MR be equipped with red, blue, and white warning lights? Like the Drake, no, please don't. <sighs> please don't. Question, can the Zeus Mark II MR be equipped with red, blue, and white warning lights like the Drake Cutlass Blue to appear as law enforcement vehicle? This is currently, this isn't currently planned, but we'll see as we go through production. Please don't. I, I it's too, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. I was initially going to say it's too American, but I mean, all, all countries have, have like warning lights on their, their law enforcement. Uh, and medical vehicles, but like it doesn't need it. It doesn't need it in a lawless, potentially lawless universe. I don't think a pirate and pyro is going to be like, oh, a ship's following me and it has it has flashing blue lights. Let me slow down. I, I just don't. I don't see the application or the reason to have like these lights on these vehicles. And I'm actually thinking about like the, the C8R Pisces, right? The C8R Pisces is the, um, the medical variant of that ship. And when you turn on your lights, it's like all or nothing. When you turn on your lights, like you need to see, it turns on your warning lights and now all of a sudden you're flashing red, you're giving off your location. I'm not sure you wanna give off your location when you're flying to go help a downed individual. If you're going to a bunker to to rescue a player, why would you want to signal yourself? Why would you want to like literally put everybody's attention on your vehicle when you land? It it operationally doesn't make sense. Right? In the military, like special forces, all the direct action that we were a part of, we didn't want anything. Like we called it sanitized. We didn't want anything to show anybody that we knew or were part of anything <laughs> like that's the whole point like don't look at me don't look at me uh, i'm not even here so anything that you could do to like stay out of the light um, is more realistic in actual real world application i don't i don't know why you would want to do that here back to the article does the zeus have an external docking collar um, there is absolutely i thought we just asked that I thought we had just asked that. All right. And that's it. So I wanted to go through the Q&A for the RSI Zeus. It's a brand new ship. A lot of excitement is out there for these ships. And in my community, through everybody that I follow on Twitter, people are most excited about the, uh, the Bounty Hunter, the MR variant. It seems like it's going to be a very, very exciting, um, very exciting ship to introduce into the universe. The Squadron 42 monthly report also came out. It came out through email and obviously it's available in Spectrum. I am torn whether or not I want to go through it. Um, a lot of, I guess the highlight for me personally is a lot of this is buttoning up. So it's actually shorter. Let me just share my screen. It's actually shorter than some of the other uh, reports that we've seen. Like it shouldn't be too long to go through each one of these. I'm not going to for this podcast, but a lot of it is buttoning up. It's, hey, we showcased this during Citizen Kind, so we're gonna make sure it actually works. <laughs> um, so there's like AI features and content that they obviously need to significantly um, improve before it gets to the in-game environment. So there's some 
comments about that, but there was nothing else, and I, I usually say this if I don't dive into line by line, there's nothing that really stood out as we absolutely should cover this and dive into um, any sort of explication over uh, over the article. So I'm actually going to I'm actually going to move on if that's okay with you. Here we go. Time for the purpose of today's podcast. Yeah, I've got all the sound effects today, guys. All the sound effects. I'm actually working on a few other like segment bumpers. Um, it's gonna be interesting. But if this is like a podcast, I want this to be as not aesthetically. That's a visual. I want this to be very audibly pleasing while you're listening. So like the the bourbon segment, I'm kind of I'm gonna put us into a tavern, and it's gonna sound like a bar. Like you're sitting with me across like the bar table, um, or the bar. I completely digress real time. Here we go. IAE 2953. So on, um, I keep saying Monday or Tuesday. What day was November 6th? Well, uh, Monday. All right. So on Monday, they, Jake Acapella or Jake Bradley um, wrote this into the spectrum. It was kind of the preview. This came out before the actual website came out, but it was a spectrum that read, IAE 2953, welcome to the Tobin Expo Center. The Galaxy's premier annual aerospace event, the Intergalactic Expo IAE, starts soon on November 17th, and it goes to November 30th, just as an aside. We've just launched the IAE 2953 website with more info about the event taking place at the Tobin Expo Center on Microtech, including the official schedule. Now, it's always, it hasn't always been, at the Tobin Expo Center in Microtech. But for what we are concerned with as gamers, yes, it's always been a Microtech for us. Uh, we'll get into the reason why or the lore here in a couple of minutes. There's the link to the page. We're actually going to go into that here next. Uh, back to the article. Add the event to your calendar and prepare for 14 days of celebration during this year's IAE 2953 with new vehicle announcements, special edition paints, which I'm pretty damn sure is like purple and light blue, <laughs> and free test flights for over 100 flyable ships. Stay up to date with the latest news and updates by opting in our daily IAE 2953 newsletter. Join us for Intergalactic Aerospace Expo 2953, and don't forget that Star Citizen will be free to play from November 17th to November 30th. So if you are listening to this podcast, I usually don't do this. If you are listening to this podcast or you're watching it on YouTube, I do have... I have a player referral code that no one's ever used, and it's fine. I don't market it. Like I said, I don't do this. Um, but I do have a referral code. The 5,000 AUEC that you get for using it is irrelevant. That's not what this is about. But you do want to use it during events like this because you will get a free uh, ship. Usually it's lifetime insurance. The one time, in fact, I got my brother, when my brother joined, the one time it was used, I got the Dragonfly. So I have a Dragonfly lifetime insurance, and he also got the Dragonfly lifetime insurance vehicle for free just for using the referral code. That will be in the notes, in the podcast notes and or or and the YouTube notes as well. So feel free to use it. Helps me out, helps you out. You get a free ship. Um, anyways, digression. Here we go. We can't wait to see you there. And don't forget to stop by Wally's Bar and restock your drinks. Let's get straight into the website. Here we go. So you can go to IAE2953.com or go through the Robert Space Industries portal and you will find this webpage. There's not a lot of information on it because it's still a countdown to IAE, but this is going to be your home um, for the next, what, three weeks. So this week going into the end of November. So IAE is going to begin, if you're listening to this podcast or at the time of recording this podcast, it's seven days, three hours, and 43 minutes from now. <laughs> Super exciting. Um, you add that to your calendar, feel free. Uh, but here we go, IE returns. I, this is basically what Jake wrote in his letter, so I'm not necessarily going to read all of this, but I do wanna show y'all the Explore a Universe of Possibilities video. So let me turn down, it's gonna probably be loud at first. 
Yep. All right, so let me go ahead and play this real quick for everybody and uh, and enjoy. X Experience a universe of possibilities. Intergalactic Aerospace Expo 2953. All your favorite ships and manufacturers. Plus, a few new surprises. Touching down at Tobin Expo Center, November 17th. Beautiful. Beautiful. Here's my reaction to that. Um, right towards the very end, they said, and a couple of surprises, or a few surprises. Um, if you've been watching the roadmap updates, you know what those surprises are. Or at least you should have a really good idea what those surprises are. One is going to be the Tumbral Storm. We know that that's in production. We know that it's out of gray box phase. Like, it's, it's done. I'm pretty sure they're on... Uh, the level of detail zero, the LOD zero. I, I'm pretty sure they're good to go. Uh, I'm, I'm, that is going to be one of them. In fact, whenever they <laughs> made that comment in the video, they showed the side of Tumbral. Of course, it's going to be the Tumbral Storm. I also think the Apoa Centauk Yai is also going to be coming out as well. Um, I, I didn't see like anything in that video. Let's see here. see plus a few new surprises all right there's your few new surprises there's the tumbrel that's the um, it's like back end i think of the tumbrel storm so that's i guarantee you that is the tumbrel storm that looks maybe like the redeemer i don't maybe like a redeemer variant i don't know like that is that is the redeemer absolutely but maybe a variant Hmm. Probably not, but that's just what I see. <laughs> now that right there, uh, that right there is the alien symbol, and I'm pretty sure this is where they're going to be introducing the Apoa Santaki. My two cents. <laughs> uh, but anyways, that's also been in production. If you've been watching, you know, any sort of content creators or reading the roadmap update yourself, you know that the Santaki is right around the corner. It got revisited because of the dashboard and kind of the interior needed rework. Um, so it quote unquote failed its gray box testing. Um, but that was a long time ago. So that was, I think, Q1, if I'm not mistaken, um, of this year. So it's it's ready. And, and they just released the FHC Live. Lightning, and supposedly the F8C Lightning is the antithesis or the opponent um, that was built to combat the Santaki. Um, pretty, pretty sure about the, all, all of that. Could also be wrong. I don't know. I don't have my notes in front of me. <laughs> um, all right, the expo schedule. This was the first post that I made. Um, it got like I don't know, three thousand, four thousand impressions. It, it was. It was well received, but I basically just took this image and I announced it on socials. You know, here are the dates. I made it linear as opposed to this like um, this and uh, linear. I made it a list as opposed to this graphic. So the list listing off like here is um, the the manufacturers per day. Um, quickly, November 17th and 18th, each vendor gets two days. And usually at the very end during the finale, every ship goes on sale. So the first date range I'm going to tell you is when those companies go on sale. And I'm going to, I just realized I didn't do any homework. I'm going to be guessing on some of these vendors. <laughs> Here we go. November 17th through 18th. The, the Gattacapoa, Banu, and Asperia. That was pretty easy. November 18th through 19th, Aegis, right? Aegis Dynamics. Um, and there's going to be an Apex Hall and a Zenith Hall, usually because what is... What is live one day gets moved um, to the next hall the next day. So you'll have two vendors overlapping um, each day, right? So on the 18th, you'll have all the alien ships plus Aegis. Aegis is in the Zenith, the Zenith hall and the alien ships are in the Apex hall. And then they'll just rotate, right? So November 19th through 20th is Crusader and Tumbrel. November 20th through 21st is Origin Jumpworks. 21 through 22, Drake. 22 through 23, Argo, Consolidated Outland, Gray Cat, and Kruger. 
November 23, or 23 through 24, Anvil Aerospace. November 24 through 25, Mirai and Misk. Makes sense. November 25 through 26, RSI. And November 26th is the best in show, weapons and armor. So it's all your paint jobs, right? Your paint jobs and your packages. Usually what they'll do, and I bought, this is, I actually bought last year's best in show bundle, which was like the, let me see if I can remember. It was the, the Carrick, the, yeah, Scorpius. Okay, so it was the Carrick, the MSR, the Pisces, and the um, Scorpius. Good lord, I just literally just said it. But you could buy all four of those. Why am I saying Pisces? I don't. It wasn't the Pisces. Uh, here we go. You guys are watching this real time. Here we go. Let's do uh, hanger dot link. Hanger link. It already has my data in there. Packs. The or oh, did I not keep that pack? I have embarrassed myself on live. <laughs> it's the it is for sure the Carrick Scorpius, the MSR, and for the life of me, that third ship. It's not the Pisces. All right, we're gonna move on for the sake of my sanity, and if I'm able to kind of squeeze it in towards uh, <laughs> uh, towards the end here. Anyways, here we go. All right, so the next level to this, a couple of days later, I posted the um, the limited hull ships. And so what we'll do for those of you on YouTube, I'm actually gonna make this a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. I'm actually going to bring up the post. Uh, here we go. So instead of looking at my list, I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna show you the, the post. So yesterday, November 8th, uh, actually two days ago, November 8th, here's your 5.6K uh, views, awesome. Here is your limited whole ship per, like per day. So on the 18th and 19th, it's Aegis, and you're gonna have both the Idris and the Javelin. We'll go through prices here in a second. But you're gonna have the Idris uh, P, and if you buy the Idris P in the pledge store, you will get the ability to purchase the upgrade to the Idris K. The difference, the Idris P does not have the massive cannon. I think it's like a size 10 cannon um, on the front. It's just a civilian variant. First off, the Idris M is the military variant found in Squadron 42. Then you have the Idris P, which is your civilian variant, but then you can get an aftermarket kit like I just mentioned that will upgrade the components with lifetime insurance that'll make it the Idris K, which is basically the Idris M. Okay, moving on. <laughs> the Aegis Javelin. There's one Javelin to rule them all. There's one version. There's not like several different types. It's literally just the Javelin. On November 20th and 21st, the Origin 890 Jump. Okay. Pretty obvious there. On the 21st and 22nd, you got the Drake Kraken and the Drake Kraken Privateer. So you have a different version. Now here is a little bit of an interesting story about the Drake Kraken. So I had bought the original Kraken because I wasn't sold on um, needing all the ships because I have the Bonnie Merchantman. I was going to use the Bonnie, the Bonnie Merchantman as my um, stores or my mercantile loop. But then I saw the privateer and I'm like, damn it, there's there's so much potential with parking that privateer, uh, you know, somewhere to build a base, quote unquote, but it'd be so awesome to have a storefront wherever you could put it. Like, and so my, my cosplay, my role play, mine started getting activated. So when you buy the Kraken, you don't get the aftermarket kit to upgrade to the private tier like you do with the Idris K unless you file a ticket with CIG. And that's what I did last year. I bought the original Kraken. I didn't see the pledge store ability to upgrade to the private tier, um, but I did submit a ticket and it unlocked the ability for me to purchase the private tier upgrade. Now I haven't activated it yet. So right now in my hangar, I've got the original Kraken, and I did purchase, it's like $300, I did purchase the uh, privateer upgrade kit. I haven't applied it yet. And the cool part about that is I have, uh, I have time. I have infinite time to decide whether or not I want this to remain 
as um, kind of just like your everyday Kraken with you know landing pads, or I could admit, uh, I could bite the bullet and upgrade it to the Privateer with a click of a button. So that's pretty cool. November 22nd through 23rd, the CO Pioneer, the Consolidated Outland Pioneer. This is going to be super, super important going into base building. This is your base builder. So I have a feeling, I have a feeling that the CO or the, the Consolidated Outlander Pioneer is going to be a hot, hot, hot ship for this season. November 24th through 25th, the Misk Hull E as an Echo. This thing is a beast. It is an absolute beast. Um, and I'm pretty sure it still does not have landing gear. So there's a whole loop that needs to be created um, or needs to be finalized before they release the Misk Hole E. It can't land. So it's not like you can um, land at a mining facility or like it has to be in a LEO, uh, a low environment orbit. Um, they're not all low environment though. I'll just say orbital station. Um, you have to go to an orbital station to offload and load. And I think that still needs some work, but the whole E is so, so huge. It's going to be the largest, um, it's going to be the largest shipping, uh, shipping loop or transportation loop vehicle possible, I think. And last but not least, November 25th through 26th, the RSI Constellation Phoenix. Now, this is not the Constellation Phoenix Emerald. That's a Fortuna or a it's like St. Patrick's Day only event um, available item. But it is the RSI Constellation Phoenix, um, and that's for the 25th and 26th. What I do want to do in my notes, I didn't have a pretty way of showing y'all, so you're just going to get this audibly. But in my notes, I did put this. The prices. I had a lot of people ask me on Twitter. I had a lot of people ask me about the prices and what to expect. Now, prices are subject to change. So when I bought these last year, it's not necessarily the price that you will see in two weeks. It could be, but maybe not. Maybe not. So you have the uh, the Aegis Idris P. That's hard to say. The Aegis Idris. The Aegis Idris P is a thousand dollars. The uh, hold on, that's not true. The Aegis Idris M, which I'm pretty sure you can't buy in the pledge store, but available in Squadron 42 on Star Citizen Tools, it said that it was a thousand dollars. But I'm pretty damn sure you can only buy the Idris P. I could be wrong in this moment. I actually cannot say yes or no. And what I will do. You know what? I'm not going to do that. Let's get into the Id the pledge store. If I go to pledge store and if I go to ships and I go to Idris, I'm pretty sure you can only buy the P. No, you can buy the Idris M. I and, and this I am so glad I did this live with you on on air. So the Idris M is the military variant uh, and the Idris P is the civilian Variant. Let me actually click into this. Sharing my screen for those of you on YouTube. Here's the Idris M. I want to look at the va uh, the variance matrix. The difference here. All right. It looks like the. Let me just read the descriptions. So the Idris M. It is the military variant, larger than a bomber but smaller than a ship of the line. Frigates occupy an interesting space in the pa pantheon of warships. While they lack the heavy armor and the capital weaponry of a cruiser, frigates are more maneuverable and are highly configurable. The Idris P is a Mark II Peacekeeper variant developed for the UEE Patrol Services. The Idris P strips the standard ship's ship-to-ship -ship gun in sp uh, spinal mount in favor of additional cargo capacity and superior speed. There you go. So you do have a military variant that's more of a combat Idris P, which is more of like your everyday um, living space. And then the aftermarket, uh, the K kit, will bring it up to what you see Um with the huge cannon in the front, etc. And now that I say that, I kind of, I now want to show y'all what the kit looks like. Sharing screen, extras, products. I actually like doing this with y'all. Okay, so the Aegis Idris, you can see this in the store because I own an Idris. 
you can see this as a war bond for $250. The Aegis Idris P aftermarket war bond kit. Let's take a look at it. This makes it an Idris K, <clears throat> but it gives you the Hurston Dynamics Exodus laser beam. That's that freaking huge cannon in the front uh, of the ship. But it also gives you um, the uh, Amon and Reese Haro anti-ship missile launcher. Two of those. It gives you two bearing M2C PDSs. Uh, it gives you four of those. <laughs> it gives you four bearing M2C PDSs and lifetime insurance on all of those components. And that's important too, because the components, um, those are going to be very, very, very expensive components if you don't have lifetime insurance on them and you keep blowing up your Idris. So, all right, we digressed horribly. So we talked about the Constellation Phoenix. We talked about the Idris. Oh, we uh, the, into the prices. So the Aegis Idris M is $1,000. The P is $1,500. And the K, uh, you basically add the aftermarket kit. It's about $1,800. The Aegis Javelin, the most expensive ship in the game, is $3,000. The Origin 890 Jump is $950. The Drake Kraken is $1,650 or $1,650. The Private Tier is $2,000. The Pioneer is $850. The Hull E is $750. And then you have the Constellation Phoenix, which is $350. Last but not least, I want to get into how to approach these limited hull ships. So Solace, sounds great, man. I really want to get a Javelin. I have $3,000 to spend. <laughs> What's the best way to go about doing this? Oh, man. Um... Okay, I gave you the war bond prices on purpose, right? Because you have a little bit more time to put your ship in the cart and spend new money on a limited whole ship than the F5, the Foxtrot, the F5 war that takes place for those wanting to use store credit. So if you had $3,000 in store credit, you could use store credit and purchase the Javelin. You could. Just know that there are tens of thousands of people trying to do the same thing for like 100 of these ships. It is almost impossible. I say almost. But you have to be, for, for us in Texas, at 11 a.m. sharp, you are tapping F5 in the pledge store. And the moment that that ship spawns in the pledge store it is a race to put it into your cart choose the right credit card or store credit and hit checkout you just have a little bit more time with war bond because not everybody has three thousand real life money hanging around ready to spend in november a lot of people don't <laughs> um so that's what you want to do it, it is highly likely and i saw it with especially with the whole e it is highly likely that those those will come and go on the pledge store throughout the two days. And, and no, I'm not suggesting that you camp out and you watch the pledge store for 48 hours, but maybe once an hour or as frequent as you can, hit F5 and refresh because every now and then a payment won't go through and a single ship will come back online. I saw it happen a few times last year with the Origin 890 Jump. Yeah, it was sold out within the first couple of seconds, but hours later, I would see that, oh, one it became available, and like a minute later it was gone. But like credit card payments fail, or people end up having like buyer's remorse and they melt, or I, I don't know. I don't know why it would necessarily come back on, but you'll see them sporadically come back. So it's not like at 11 a.m. U.S. Central is your one chance, and that that's it. Um, keep at it. It's it's highly unlikely that like a javelin is gonna respawn, you know, the next day, midday. It's it's highly unlikely, uh, but it's possible but you want it to be tapping the F5. Now here is my second comment. If you are able to get that ship into your cart, but the payment doesn't go through because it, sell, it, it sell, sells out, do not empty your cart. Keep it in your cart. Don't empty it because you've just eliminated half the steps. So let's say it's 
Invictus launch week in 2024, or heaven forbid, it's next November next year. You've already got it in your cart. It's there. It's sitting there. That half the steps have already been completed. So all you have to do at 11 a.m. is refresh your cart and then hit purchase and you're done. So trick of the trade. If you get into your cart, don't remove it. Don't remove it. And I'm pretty sure like throughout the rest of the next year, you can you can purchase other ships. Uh, it'll just say like this one item can't go through because it's sold out. You're like, okay, Roger, but you're not going to, you're not going to delete it. So you're not going to remove it out of your cart. Okay. We are going to wrap up today's episode with the lore behind IAE. My personal, um, love of of what I do this uh, for or why I create content is like the why the story behind everything and what I wanted to do is get into the intergalactic aerospace expo but then I also want to get into the Whitley's guide which is a huge factor or a huge tool that's used in IAE and then Jax McClearly Jax McCleary um, he's he's a a fan favorite NPC that has a huge role as well in IAE. So without further to do, let me share my screen. Let's read through IAE Whitley's guide. Checks McClearly. I cannot say his name McCleary. <laughs> uh, and then we'll wrap this one up. Here we go. The intergalactic aerospace expo, the intergalactic Aerospace Expo is an annual spacecraft exposition that is held in the UEE. Founded in 2670 by spacecraft enthusiast Audrey Timmerman, it was initially held on Castor, Coral 4, until 2847, when the board of directors voted to rotate the location of the IAE each year. This continued until the board voted to permanently host the event on Severus, Kyle 3, in the Kyle system in 2913. Spacecraft manufacturers such as Drake, Consolidated Outland, Origin Jumpworks, used the expo to debut new ships and run sales. I wonder if they're hinting at anything of potential releases probably not <laughs> it is usually held over 10 standard earth days starting in 2948 the iae began hosting satellite events to allow more people to attend with several being hosted in the stanton system since its premiere in 2950 the spectrum show whitley's guide runs a special series of episodes on the iae each year hosted by Jax mccleary End of article. So Whitley's Guide, you would be familiar with Whitley's Guide on uh, the RSI website because they usually have these uh, narratives on ships, like Whitley's Guide to the 600i. That was a couple of episodes ago. Or Whitley's Guide to the blank, whatever ship that is. Well, they also do some videos um, during the events. And I think it's it's fun. It's lighthearted. Usually it's... um, kind of a, a quip, if you will, <clears throat> to some things that are going on in the universe. Invictus launch week this past year, it was fun watching um, the story each day. Um, I'm excited to see what they do with this. And actually, I brought up Invictus launch week. Um, here's the difference. The difference between IAE and Invictus launch week, those are your two main ship sales each year. So Invictus launch week is usually May. It's around May each year, but that is strictly the military ships. It's strictly military. It's to celebrate new pilots that are flying for the UEE Navy, right? And so there it's a, it's a celebration for their promotions or their um, uh, officership commission. There you go, their commissions. <laughs> um, so it, again, it's military variants uh, of each one of the uh, ship manufacturers. Fast forward to November timeframe, the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo is for every ship. So where you don't, or you have a limited number of ships that you can fly in Invictus launch week, you have over a hundred ships that you can fly during IAE. This is the time and it's brilliant marketing from a business perspective, because we're getting into the December holidays, um, 
it's brilliant timing, but this is the time to buy your ships. Usually your insurance, it's not all lifetime insurance, but they'll increase it to like 120 months, which is 10 freaking years. I'm sorry. If you're worried about lifetime insurance versus 10 years, um, that means like your kids are going to be playing with your account. Just one way of looking at that. So I just wanted to compare and contrast the two events. <clears throat> IAE, this is the time of the year to really get into all the ships. Everything is going to be available. The pledge store is going to be way too big um, to comb through. So learn how to sort it. Learn how to to filter it as a, as necessary because you're gonna you're gonna need it. Let's get into the Whitley's guide. Alrighty, just saw my notes. Here we go. Whitley's guide is a consumer-centric magazine released by Gallivan Publishing that features in-depth analysis and reviews of spacecraft vehicles and related items. Created by Sal Whitley and Darby Kylick, it was first published in 2856 and has been in continuous print since. Editors of Whitley's Guide require their reviewers to write as objectively as possible about the products that they test. In 2950, the magazine partnered with Terra Spectrum Broadcasting to launch a show by the same name, hosted by Jax McCleary. Although McCleary's enthusiastic style is a departure from the serious tone of the print magazine, his popularity with spacecraft enthusiasts made him the network's first and only choice as host. Let's get into Jax. Jax McCleary, 2887 to present, is a human journalist, pilot, and spectrum personality best known for hosting the show's Galactic Tour and Whitley's Guide. Before becoming a show host, McCleary worked as the sports anchor for the local news program in Edo on Green LS3, gaining a reputation as a bombastic tongue-in-cheek commentator on spacecraft races with deep insight on the inner workings and handling of the ships. McCleary left his position in 2931 to launch Galactic Gear, a show that examines and reviews spacecraft through often outlandish means. The show was sold in 2945 to Voyager Direct after years of rating success and was relaunched and rebranded as Galactic Tour in 2946. McCleary left the show shortly after and returned to racing commentary until accepting a contract to host Whitley's Guide in 2950. There you go. You now know everything there is to know about IAE. <laughs> uh, I'm super excited. I, I, I love this time of year because it goes from IAE, first off Thanksgiving, if you celebrate that here in America. You have Thanksgiving and then the season change into like the Christmas time frame or the December holiday time frame. You got IAE, then you got December, then you have the uh, the Luminalia, the Luminalia, the December event inside of uh, Star Citizen, and then whatever holiday you celebrate in December. It's just in the New Year's. It's like it just nonstop from here on out. I love this time of year out of game. I love this time of year in the game. Super excited. I'm working on something. I'm going to tease a little bit. I'm working on something for episode 35. So the Thursday after all this goes down, after IAE, I might have a very, very, very special guest join us uh, for a long form conversation. So stay tuned on social, stay tuned on all the things as I start teasing and asking for questions and uh, engagement from the community. So stay tuned for that. All right, everybody. You've been listening to Beyond the Verse Star Citizen podcast, obviously with your host, Solace. You can get involved in the conversation with your questions, comments, concerns, even your emotional outbursts by emailing us at contact at beyondtheversehq.com or interacting with our Spotify Q&A and polls at the end of each episode over on Spotify. Join our in-game organization, Soul Provision, by applying at www.robertspaceindustries.com forward slash orgs forward slash provision. Watch our video replays over at YouTube at youtube.com forward slash at BTV underscore cast and our conversations over on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, all at forward slash BTV underscore cast. Once again, thank you for joining us. We hope this finds you well. And until next time, safe travels as you traverse beyond the verse. Take care, everybody.